Thanks, Angela. And going to Rushanara, please. Thank you very much. I've, I've got a few follow-ups and also I wanted oh. to concentrate uh, my questions around supervision and authorization. Uh, so, Governor, I was on the committee under uh, Nikki Morgan when all of this happened, as were a couple of other oh. colleagues, I think. And so Nikki Morgan um, called for, this committee called for the investigation. Um, yes. And it back in uh, 2019, if I recall. Um, can you just talk us through what you did when the stories started to break and it became a big problem in terms of immediate action to to, um, <laughs> to prevent you and your senior colleagues from having sleepless nights worrying about what happened? What, what are the steps you took in relation to the contact centre and um, safeguards to make sure that there aren't other things like that um, uh, sort of buried in the in the patchwork of issues that, uh, and regulations that you oversee? And at that point, yeah. you know about the 4% of inaccurate uh, answered calls that were inaccurate, just to get the chronology right. So LCNF um, broke in December 2018. Yep. Um, in terms of what we did, by that stage, we were really towards the, well, at the end of the implementation phase of the delivering effective supervision and delivering effective authorizations programs. So we had reached pretty much the end of that phase of the work. There's still quite a large phase of what I call transformation and a lot of the <laughs> big phases, <laughs> IT investment going on. But so I just, I just wanted to know sure. what you and your colleagues did. I mean, I, I'm sure you did lots of things uh, as soon yeah. as this, this scandal was uncovered. What specifically did you do? And at that point, did you know there were 4% of calls that were not answered? No, the 4% um, number, um, mm -hmm. I, I've actually only, I mean, I think there was, by the way, look, the 4% number is, is, I should say, a, I think a first cut. I mean, it, it may change. Let's be clear. I, I wouldn't because I can't speak with the SA. They've no doubt done more work. I think that number really only became clear about a year ago, actually. Okay. Um, um, so we didn't you, know that. You had a time. sense that there was a problem in the contact centre, that the supervision and authorization and the connection between the two might have been an issue, I imagine. Well, we knew that. What did you, do? What did you we already do? knew we knew that, but we'd already known that because the PA report had pointed to it. I guess, I guess the question is, what did you do before the investigation? I know once you get into in investigations and reports and so on, external reports, it becomes more complicated. But what did the organisation do when you uncovered this problem? Because well, I, mean, the, the, I suppose the key thing was, have the reforms that we've already done, you know, which of these issues have they tackled and which have they not tackled? I mean, that was the immediate. To, I mean, other than dealing with LCNF itself as an issue, the question was to sort of map what we'd done by then onto the, the problems that we identified. So you're right. I mean, Supervision Hub, as it was then called Contact Centre, you know, had we, you know, where, where had we got to mm. with that series of changes? Where had we got to with the IT systems changes that were causing the problems with management information? Where had we got to in terms of integrating uh, supervision and, and bringing financial promotions into the in, into that? So that, but yes, I mean all of those things were highly relevant in my view. Okay, uh, but but there wasn't there there wasn't there weren't other there weren't there was a process that allowed you to assess whether there were other LCF type cases around the corner. Oh, we had a lot of work on mini bonds going on, but I mean that. Okay. So yes, there was a very large amount of work on mini bonds. I mean mini bonds are not. I mean, they're not this, it's a bit of a catch-all phrase for a lot of things. Okay, so just, just going on, on to sort of supervision again. Um, the investigation um, found that the FCA's supervisory process on uh, approach on firms um, such as LCF was not necessarily reflective of the public statements during the relevant period. Uh, were your public statements therefore misleading customers because certainly I mean in my own experience of some constituents who came to me when they had um the when when they were when they found themselves victims of the mm. LCF scandal uh were not uh, they were under the impression that there were safeguards and there's obviously this issue around supervision supervision supervised activity and, and unsupervised activity that that comes up quite frequently um, do you think that the FCA actually misled the public with those public 
statements? Well, I, I mean, we can go back to the question of the 4% of calls. And I think it's, it's, it's extremely relevant, or whatever that percentage is. I mean, let's call it 4% for the moment. I mean, it's, it's very relevant to that question because, I, I, you know, I, I think we fear that in there are some people who were led to believe there was FSCS cover when there wasn't. But the FCA's, to quote, the FCA handbook says the FCA will adopt a preemptive approach, which will be based on making forward-looking judgments about firms, yeah. business models, product strategy, and how they run their businesses to enable the FCA to identify yes. early and early. That is, of course, exactly what we would want for as, our constituents. And that's, that's what we would do. I mean, that, was the, that was the part, a very big part of the change we were putting in. But it because hadn't it was, actually... Well, it came in during... Years. I mean, uh, the point is that the, the programme came in, and much of the implementation happened really from the fourth quarter of 2017 through about, yeah. I don't know, about the third quarter of 2018, and LCF was identified sort of early autumn 2018. So having done all of the work, by the time you were leaving the FCA, did you feel com confident that those reforms, along with some of the immediate internal uh, changes and look, looks at the minibond issues more widely, that you left the organisation in a shape where this, this is less likely to, or hopefully not likely to happen? I, I, I am of the view that, although others must judge it, you know, that the SCA was a very changed organisation. Um, you know, I'm honestly, you know, I, I'm, what I observed the SCA doing over the last year, I'm pretty proud of, frankly. I think they've done some very good so, things so in the Well, not, 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 not that I haven't led them, but, you know, I'm proud of what they've been doing. Um, so I think it is a changed organisation. I really do think it's a changed organisation. But look, it's for others to judge. I mean, it, I, you know, it's not for okay. me to... So I've got two more quick questions. One is about the, the, in terms of the points you've made, which are perfectly legitimate about the scale of activity that you inherited, the organization inherited, yes. and the tens of thousands of smaller companies you were required to supervise, there is an inherent tension, which is about this point about prioritization. Yes. Uh, and, and the question is that actually the, the, one can draw conclusions from that, which is that the FCA could continue given the breadth of activity and that inherent tension that leads to less oversight, if you like, of the minibond type scandals or emerging issues um, and the necess necessary, necessarily yeah. requ necessary requirement to focus on the, the bigger problems so that you don't get a, a multi, you know, hundreds of million pound worth of scandals. But that doesn't, yeah. serve, that doesn't serve the ordinary um, member of the public who might have invested 20,000, as was in my case, in my constituents' case, yeah. uh, compared to uh, something that's worth a larger amount. So the question is, is the FCA actually, um, uh, in terms of, <laughs> you're making a judgment call, but some people will suffer as a result because you're going to have yeah. to put your energy on the bigger problems, bigger prizes. Yeah, yeah. As a result, should the FCA not be responsible for this area of activity and if it has to continue to be responsible then you know how do we avoid you having to make a choice your successor having to make these choices because that's essentially it sounds like you kind of made a judgment call which was we're going to focus our effort on the the bigger bigger issues and put the others sort of to you know further down the price yeah. It just cost 230 million people pounds to uh, to ordinary people and that's a worrying problem uh and the final thing i would say is that i was struck by a headline which came out of at the back of this particular report um in the times you know um which i thought uh you might want to comment on um which which was about whether um the fca is gun shy you know whether you use your powers and this came up in the past as well uh, do you, do, 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 does the head of the FCA, whether it's you or your successor, have you know uh, enough of the powers, or is it about willingness to use powers? Can I just say, if I don't ask the full question, I, I lost the sound in the middle, but I think I've got it. But um, okay, well, if, I can, you know, I can please come back to me if I haven't. Sure. On the no, I'll, I'll let me kick. I'll go and you know say shout. shout Shoot me up at the end if I, um, you know, don't don't cover everything. Um, well, the headline, headline is actually the headline. Strongly agree with you. The headline, just to say, the Times headline was how the gun shy regulator was left shooting blanks. So the shooting analogy is well well made. Yeah. Keep going. Um, 
I, I wrote three things down, actually. Um, the first one is, is the point you rightly make about the case of um, what I might call monetary thresholds. So the original 2013 FCA model had in it a monetary threshold that if the harm was below a certain number, um, it, the FCA didn't follow it up. The problem with that was, and this was probably accentuated by small firms coming in, but the, yeah. the problem with that was that, you know, clearly, you know, your constituents, you know, would have a good case here. Well, it's unfair for people who have smaller amounts of resources, but for whom the loss of those resources is, you know, equally, if not more devastating, to be told, I'm sorry, you're not big enough to matter. Yeah. And we changed that, but it is, you know, it, and, and, a lot, and, and a lot of the work on high cost credit, you know, came out of that. But it is a challenge, I mean, because it, in a sense, it puts more stuff into, onto the landscape as it were to prioritize. The, the second thing, I mean, I, this is a suggestion, uh, and this, by the way, suggestion is, 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 is uh, Nickel may have to say it differently here because he may have changed the way they do it. I think one of the things I would advise, if, if they're still doing it as I did it, and, and the board did it in my time, was that, you know, I think the committee can say to the FCA, when you do your annual business plan, and there's a, quite a big prioritization exercise done, and it's done every autumn. Um, don't just tell us what you have prioritized. Tell the Treasury Committee what you haven't, you know, what, what fell below the line and why. Because it was a, it was a pro, it was an exhaustive process. So that, you know, certainly in my day, you could you could have that. Yeah, you know, there'd be no problem with having that. And and you know, you may have you may have views on it. Um on powers, um I I mean I think there are issues around the perimeter. Um on powers. I'm not sure how many issues there are inside the perimeter on powers these days, um, but I think again, it, you know, Charles and Nicola are much better placed nowadays to judge that than I am. So we should we should expect the FCA to... I, I, I mean, the one thing I would say about being... So many blanks in the future then to protect our constituents. I don't know if you put that. Well, I mean... <laughs> What I would say is that your first, your first question is hugely relevant here. There is always a prioritization exercise, unless the FCA is going to be you know, a vastly bigger organization than it is today. And I think it's wise to know what that prioritization is. Okay, thank you. I think I'm out of time. Thank you.